uh, many are always excited and always working on projects, actually many of them actually fail. And I met 99% of the people you meet in the first year, in the last quarter of the year, will talk to you about their failures. And that's an important insight to really take away. It's not, Silicon Valley is really not only about finding gold, it's a lot about failing. And the whole industry is somewhat professionalizing the failure mechanism. And if you think about the returns of VCs in Silicon Valley, I think we all right. And that's what he called always the solution mindset. And that's something I really learned. People tend to have a solution mindset. And it's a big, big hurdle for real innovation. The solution mindset that we all have. Think about it. If you see a problem, you think about a solution. But to think about a solution is always only think about 10% more. It's only about thinking incremental solution here. So most people really would say, give her a ladder or a helper, get the book out of the shelf. And that's okay, but it's only incremental. Now, what I learned over there, and it was part of like my everyday work from there on, was really to, to get into a pain point mindset, which can be much more fundamental. And if you think about what is the actual pain point of that girl here, it's pretty obvious if you think about it, but most people don't in the first place. Her pain point is that she just needs to know something, most likely. Yeah. Most likely she just needs to know something. And once you do that step back and really only think about the fact her pain point is to know something, you will end up in a completely different world. Most people wouldn't solve the knowledge pain point with the library maybe. You find solutions like, of course, pretty obvious, building Wikipedia. You find solutions like you know, offering a tutoring service, changing the education system, you can think about somewhere solutions. And that's what people over there do, and people are trained to do over there. To really always take a step back. And that's something I really took away from my work, to always remind myself, and also our innovation teams, and of course also people we work with, to do the step back into the pain point mindset. And it sounds easy, but I can tell you, it's every time we do the session with almost every company, it always ended up being a solution mindset. So, and that's why Silicon Valley really tries to go for 10x and not 10%. That's actually something that Google says and what they are also doing with all their big projects. Don't go for 10%, go for 10x. And this all sounds very trivial, right? I mean, I can say that here on the stage, but to really do that and really go fundamentally and radically to a different level, that's a great takeaway. And you can do that as well if you always go to the pain point level. And I have a, a very concrete example, because this kind of sounds abstract, that girl, I mean, it's just an abstract example. But I have a very concrete example. It's a friend of mine who came out of Stanford a year ago, and he was looking at you know industry uh, like mobile mobile trend. Okay, smartphone. Anyone has a smartphone? And he looked at churches, and he realized well churches they don't do anything with mobile phones so far. So he wanted to build a company that offers mobile apps, and mobile services for churches. Maybe that churches can present themselves. There's a communication between the priests and, and you know people going to the church. And he pitched that project in Silicon Valley, and he got really a backlash. He thought it's a great idea, but he got a real backlash that is too small. That if he wants to go into this market, he has to build something more fundamental. That's the feedback he got. And what he did, he really went to that pain point level, and he was really guided by the investors over there, and really thought about what is the actual pain point of people going to the church. Well, it's probably just it's praying, it's sharing, maybe talking, or even only thinking about their problems or their needs. And it's a sense of community. And he really ended up, in the end, to not build something for that system, like with the library. He really pitched and really pivoted into building a mobile church, into really kind of trying to build a new church. And this is kind of sounds totally kind of, you know, you laugh about it, I laughed about it when I heard about it. But the thing he did, it was just four months ago, he really, and the name is funny, and he really launched the first kind of mobile church. It's called Instapray, because the name is kind of silly with Instagram, right? Uh, and, and I laughed about it as I told you, but he launched a project and suddenly investors kind of were really focused on him. And that was really interesting for me. For me it was a ridiculous idea. It's much safer to build that church application. One month after launching the, the project, he had one million active prayers on, on the platform. And I think that's really astonishing. I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, how many, how many projects do we launch that do have one, one million interactions in, in one month, right? And, it's, and if you think about it, I laughed about it. It's really powerful. It's really true that many people just want to share, just want to pray, especially in the Anglo-American culture also. And you can see there are people from the Philippines and, and actually Christians who are praying and who are followed and co-prayed or whatever it's called by, by, by um, Muslims. Yeah. So it's really an amazing new tool. It's very simple. 
but I think it shows that he really did not think about the next 10%. He didn't build for the church in his community the first mobile app and tried to sell it for $14.99 per month. Right? He really tried to kind of change the system. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do that, but I think it's interesting that investors over there would rather invest in a really radical solution than, than in an incremental, incremental new idea. And I, I believe so. He got a more than seven digit investment now, and I think it actually can be really good. So, think radical, not 10%, but 10x. Try to do that and do it with a pain point uh, solution. So, the next thing that really hit me as well was really this radical focus. So it's not only thinking big. I mean, you always see a civic is about thinking big. And I talked a little bit about it. So I like more think radical. But they don't only think big, they are able to focus at the same time. And I think that's a really a skill to, 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 have, to hit that balance. It's a real skill they have over there. Those who are really successful uh, day by day. And what I mean by focus is a typical product concept, and you might know that, a typical product concept we get today, but also there from all the companies who came in really look like this. And if you think about it, that's really so often the case. You get a 60-page Word document and all that story, you know about it. Very often people look at the market, they look at what's already in the market, what, who are the competitors, and they say, oh wow, that's about 40 features, let's all put them in one product and we're going to have the best product by, by standard, by rule, right? Just, just take every good feature, put it in one product, and those will be the best-selling product. And it's some, it looks trivial if I, look, if I show it to you like this, but seriously, almost every project has a part of this thinking in it. Whereas, usually, the typical successful product really looks like this. It's actually also true for this market, the real market, for Swiss Knife. This is a much more successful product than the one before. Because it's simple, it's, it's easy to build, easy to test, of course, in the early stage, and, of course, easy to market. You know who's the target group you are. The ones who go out camping, want to drink wine, drink beer, and cut something. It's a little bit too easy, but something like that. Yeah. To market the other product, it's really difficult because almost everyone, almost 100% will tell you, I just need two or three things of that. So, the, being able to radically focus and at the same time build a new mobile church, that's something that, to hit that balance, is really something they do really, really well. And it's something that we can take away. So, I always say, you know, avoid future readings. It's a really, it's a real disease. It's always too many features in almost every project. Also for us, myself, in my daily work, I try to always think about avoid feature readings, the disease of adding too many features in the first place. So think big, think radical, and, and focus at the same time. That's already difficult enough. Uh, and, but the third factor that's really maybe most impressive, actually. I think that's, that's really so different from over here, and also from big corporations, of course, but also from our European culture, is speed. And the speed is so much higher in Silicon Valley. And the um, famous quote over there is, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. So that's, a, that's actually a quote by a speed racer. So for him, that's probably anyway true. But it's also a quote that's very often quoted in the startup community over there. And it's really about attributing more value to speed than to control. And that is so different from over here. Even for myself, I had to fight with this. Um, and for large corporations, it's especially true. If you think about it, if you look back, back at your working week and you think, oh wow, this week everything was under control, you kind of feel good about it, right? You think, okay, it's a great, it's a great status. So David Kelly, oh no, Steve Blank, I'm sorry, Steve Blank would come into the room always and ask, you know, everything under control? And everyone would say naturally, yes, yeah, sure, everything's fine. And he would say, okay, how can we solve that problem? Yeah. So, really, so how can we twice as fast? It was the first question afterwards. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting insight. And, it's of course not true for every project. I mean, you have important projects that you have to have everything under control, but in innovation where you don't know yet where you'll end up or what you need to do, speed is so much uh, more worth than control. And that's a really, it's really a deep insight for daily work. We try to do that end of the week as a management team, we don't always, but we try to. I think it's everything under control and, and we try to see this as a negative state. And I'm only talking about early innovation. Right? It's, it's not easy to do and to really act on it. It's also actually not easy to train people to think that way. And it also entails, and I think that's also interesting kind of just as a takeaway, it entails do 2080 and not 8020. I mean, we are used to say and think we are good managers if we do 8020. It's perfect, right? I mean, I'm a real good manager. I don't need 100% security. I don't need 100% perfection. I'm an 8020 guy and I'm a good manager. That's a usual thing. But over there, really, and it's connected, of course, to the speed element, 
it's really about being able to do 28 professionally. Because, and what's the reason? Because while we do 1 times 8, 20 at a large corporation, the entrepreneur over there will do 4 times 20, 80. And you can think about who learned more in this high uncertainty. Who has already talked to more customers? Who has potential of first contracts? The one who did one step 80% or the guy who did four times a 20% approach. Which means, don't think too much about it, just go out with a product that's only 20% ready. And, and, and this is, those are no made up numbers. I would even say it's, it's a more or less 10 to 1 effector, but 4 to 1 is, it sounds definitely realistic. And that is of course not easy, not easy to do, to, 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 to do, go out only with a 20% project. So that's, a, that's an important quote by Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, who said, if you're not embarrassed by your first product version, you just launched too late. I should have known that. <laughs> you just launched too late. It's a really important insight. It's okay to be embarrassed. It's okay to go out of the 20% product. And I think in our world, seriously, this, this doesn't happen. It's really, I mean, not only because it's corporate and you have to kind of, you know, you have kind of your boss who looks at it or customers. On a very personal level, I'm talking about a personal level, to go out on the street and ask people with a an almost shitty project, right? And then because the feedback you will get will, of course, be 20% good, maybe if you hit a good need. It's for sure going to be 80% to please do that product better. And it's not easy to do that. But that's what they do over there, and that's why they are faster, they learn more, and they're able to do it. It's also kind of an American culture way. They, I mean, they, always, they also say, shoot first, ask questions later, right? And it's really this mentality that, that, that drives their, their, also their action in entrepreneurship. Now, I'm not saying you should, again, you should do that in every project, but we can definitely learn from that and try to do it in how innovation works. So, action. Action is, of course, a little bit related to what I already talked about, about the 2080 speed aspect. But I think it's worth a point by itself to really take action and stop analyzing or thinking. And you know about that factor, of course, but I want to give you a real world example. So, this is a real project we did. And it was a customer who came in and was a big technology provider for stadiums or sports arenas, so baseball stadium, football stadium. And they had worked on a project for over a year, like with big presentations, technology analysis, and you know, I don't, I don't know, like everything they could do in analysis. And, and when they came, the first thing that we did, or not me, I was still kind of the learning mode back then, but especially David Kelly, was to just put everything away, literally out of the room, he really did that kind of for a mindset purpose, sat down and only took post-its and their own smartphones. So it was about mobile solution for stadiums. We drew this one the first half of the day, everyone, everyone drew down ideas. It was about then about 40 ideas that were drawn down. And in the next seven days, we visited 10 sports games with that this kind of product. And it was post-its because when you got next you just put away the, 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 the post-it and just drew the next version. And you talk to fans again. And this sounds again easy, maybe it sounds crazy, but the learning after one week was so big that it was really amazing for people to, to kind of, the PowerPoint when he brought it in after one week was almost like, okay, we've we got to do something else, right? But we can throw away a lot of it. So, so it was amazing how this prototyping from day one really helped. And I'm not talking about prototyping, that's cool. I'm talking about really embarrassing thing. You go out to a sports stadium and show those posters. Most people, you know, react by the people that you're showing me. Um, but the learning is, is really amazing. And here's another picture what we really do. I, and I just put that in here to, to have a kind of customer interview in the presentation. <laughs> this is about prototyping and testing from day one, going out, showing something, and that's a project in Germany, and to end consumers who have no idea who, who you are. I mean, you've got to convince them within 10 seconds. Otherwise, just, just don't do the part. And what's connected to that, and that's my last point in action, is really the point of fake it before you make it. And that's also something, I mean, I mean I'm, holding, I'm, I'm really giving you here the American presentation, I feel all kind of those quotes. But it's easier actually also to train your own people if you have kind of those, those words just on the wall or whatever. It really, it's easier to talk about. And fake it before you make it is a great insight. And I took this example actually because of this quote. Because this company, again, worked over a year on the project. And after one month, so we did this week by week, after one month, they really ended up with some design, it was still initial, and they had not built anything. They just faked it. But they had talked to so many customers, and responsible persons from the stadiums actually started talking to them. And of course, I mean, they see you running around, and you get in contact with them. 
And after one month, they got two contracts for building their solution. And, if, and for me, that was really an eye-opener. They were able to close two contracts, like make business, with a product they had not built. And, and that was also for them completely new. And it's the best validation, of course, you can get. And that's really fake before you make it. And again, it's a cultural thing. It's not easy to do here in Germany, right? It's also in, in America, it's much easier to do that. But it was a great insight for me. Make money before you have built uh, the product. It's, it's, I mean, it's not a very usual approach. <coughs> so action, fake it before you make it, is really a big takeaway for me. Now, the almost last point is about failure. And every Silicon Valley presentation has to talk about failure. I mean, everyone like failure culture. Everyone knows about it. We have a really very, very different failure culture over here. And it's a major hurdle for innovation in our place. But I still want to touch upon it in the context of Lean Startup. So I'm talking more about Lean Startup than about failure because you already know everything about failure. So this is a very popular image. And I know most of you might have, might have seen that before. That if people look at success, like for example Instagram, and they think it was like a straight line, it was so easy, they just worked two months and it hit off. Whereas in reality, every successful case really looks like, uh, like the one on the right hand side, a lot of movement, learning, failing, and you know, you almost gave up, a roller coaster story. And that's actually also true for Instagram. I, I read in the media like they only worked two months on it and they hit it off, and it's just not true. I talked to the founders personally, and they worked two to three years on similar projects and products and always failed until they suddenly came up with this filter idea, idea and had first customers and it kind of worked out, but they really failed for two years before that. It's important to know. Now, with Lean Startup, many people believe, and it definitely hit me when I came back last year from the US, and we are also a Lean Startup company, but everyone, everyone talks about Lean Startup and design thinking, it's, it's a big buzzword, right? But what really hit me was that many people thought Lean Startup would make it easier and cheaper. Maybe that's also typical German. Lean, cheap, good. Yeah. And many people really thought that we would go from the right hand side to the left hand side with the Lean Startup. And that's totally not true. Everyone, everyone who tells you Lean Startup is Lean Startup is cheap startup or easy startup, just don't believe it. It's a big sign of someone who has really not understood the concept. And it's really big here, I think, that people you know, talk about Lean Startup, and lean startup in a way that, that looks like left hand side. Lean Startup is really about being smarter on the right hand side. It's still going to be very challenging. It's going to be really in high uncertainty. It, it's just a set of tools to be smarter on the right hand side. And that's really important, not only, of course, by, for approaching the project, but also again to train your people and if you talk to vendors, that they also understand it's really still about the right hand side. And it's really not about easy and cheap. It's again about failing fast and failing cheap. That is your goal with Lean Startup. It's to do those steps, well, all failures usually, to do these steps quicker, faster, for less money. Don't spend as much money on failure than you would otherwise. That, that's really what Lean Startup is about. And we can talk about it afterwards if you have questions for that. Um, and if, uh, for me, it was an important point to make here around this failure topic. It's not solved by Lean Startup. It's just done more smart. By fail fast, fail cheap. So those are actually five takeaways that were important to me that, that I hope I could kind of put some color on with some examples. And, and I put those in pictures just to remember better. Some, some people work better with pictures. It's really about this topic of really thinking about the pain point and more radical. If you look at a problem set, try to find a solution outside this world you're looking at. It's about you know doing the inspray. You're having the guts to do an inspray solution and really think about, okay, wait a second, what would I do? make 10x, not 10%. It's about building a simple product and avoiding feature reviews. Right? Don't build this big life, build a small life. Take speed seriously. Value speed more than control. That's what we talked about. That the important quote here, be able to be embarrassed in the first phase. Build something, take action, make a post. Like even today or tomorrow, if you go back, try, try to do that. It's so, I mean, it's really, really difficult to do. Talk to real customers, and last but not least, the most important point, you will always be in this world. It's not going to change. And Lean Startup make, it might be one tool set, and there are many others who make you smarter in this world, and may allow you to fail faster and fail cheaper and be more effective in long, in the long term. So those were kind of the highlights of uh, my takeaways from Silicon Valley, and then we, can, we could talk about a lot more, but it's enough for one speech. So thank you very much. Uh, visit us at our booth or later.